If you're one of those people who likes to know how the magic trick is done, this isn't for you. It's better to live in blissful ignorance, because once you understand the con job the GOP pulled on America, your faith in politicians might be shattered. Make America great again. The most potent weapon in the GOP's arsenal has always been nostalgia. It's most effective when it's just long enough ago that you can revise the narrative to fit your agenda, but recent enough that it's tangible. And we're just far enough away from the Reagan era now to remember it fondly. The music was silly, the market was ripping, we got our global mojo back and beat the commies once and for all. The Shining Light on the Hill, brought to you by Ronald Reagan, Hollywood actor turned politician, the greatest Republican since Lincoln, or so we're told. Now, believe it or not, Ronald Reagan wasn't the GOP's cup of tea in the 1970s. As the governor of California, he was seen as too conservative for the mainstream Republican Party. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. At the Republican convention in 1976, Reagan was looking to upend convention and take out the weak centrist Gerald Ford for the nomination. Yes, we used to decide things at conventions. Can you imagine how incredibly democratic that must have been? But I digress. The party coalesced around Ford because he was sitting in the Oval Office at the time, and they just didn't think that Reagan's brand of ultra-conservatism would fly with the rest of the country. But when Reagan gave his convention speech, you could have heard a pin drop, and most of the party realized at that moment that they were witnessing the future of the GOP. Fast forward just four short years, and their man Ronnie utterly trounced Carter to become president. And if you haven't watched our series on Carter, I'll leave links in the description because those four years were so incredibly pivotal. But by the time Reagan came to office, Carter's term had been completely rewritten. Again, that's for another day. The important thing is that Carter couldn't overcome the once in a half century confluence of high inflation and high unemployment, a phenomenon known as stagflation. Ask grown-ups of a certain age, <clears throat> Moi? about Jimmy Carter, and they'll likely give you the same old reflexive response that he was one of the worst presidents of the modern era. But Jimmy Carter was an honest man, the least warmongering of the modern presidents, fully committed to the environment, and hopeful that he would usher in an era of peace and tranquility in the whole world. A little religious for my taste, but undeniably a good man. Unfortunately for him, the world had other plans, and economic circumstances were such that Carter was dead in the water before he ever really started. By the end of his one and only term, the world had pretty much gone to shit. At the pinnacle of despair in America, along came a relic of yesteryear. A glib former actor with shiny brill cream hair, an aw shucks delivery, and a twinkle in his eye that said, it's okay, white people. Uncle Ronnie's here and ready to make America great again. Reagan embodied frontier individualism from his cowboy movie days and free markets from his time in government. And at the time, the country was sorely in need of a psychological boost. It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980, Nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. Reagan brought the promise of a new day with his theory of Reaganomics, the cover for the con job that we're addressing today. So we're not going to talk about how he was the first president to talk about fiscal conservatism while blowing up the deficit and doubling the national debt, or how he waged a holy war on poor people by race baiting and demonizing so-called welfare queens, boosted the private prison system, ushered in the era of mass incarceration, sold arms secretly to Iran, sent military aid to extremist guerrilla groups in Indonesia, Central America, Africa, and the Middle East to overthrow democratically elected governments, and sat atop of an administration that saw investigations, indictments, or convictions of more than 130 officials. No, that's not this episode. What's been sold to us by Republican revisionists is that the Reagan-era tax cuts to the rich flooded the system with liquidity and trickled down to the masses, brought down skyrocketing interest rates, and got inflation under control, thereby restoring sanity to the markets. The fairy tale continues with Reagan wrangling out-of-control gas prices, which then steadily declined for years to come thanks to his no-nonsense stance against OPEC and tax breaks to domestic oil companies. It's an enticing narrative. It's bullshit. 
but enticing nonetheless. Here's the point about Reaganomics before we unpack the long con that keeps on conning. When Reagan took over, the biggest economic issues we faced were rampant inflation and high interest rates that were choking consumers and crushing economic investment, respectively. But it wasn't Reaganomics that saved the day. It was then Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker, a Carter appointee who Reagan kept on. Volcker steadily raised the federal funds rates over a couple of years to a peak of 20% in June 1981 as shock therapy. It eventually worked, and annual inflation collapsed from 12.5% in 1980 to 1.1% 1 .1 by 1986. Now, we can talk about Volcker. We could talk about this methodology. We could talk about whether it was a good idea or a bad idea or whether things would have naturally worked out. But the point is, he did the hard thing by straining the economy so much that we dove even further into a massive recession. And so it looked like Carter did it, but Reagan inherited it. But that really wasn't the case. Even still, it wasn't morning in America again. And a newly elected Republican administration had a big liquidity problem. And Volcker's move, while staving off hyperinflation, plunged the country into a deep recession in the short term. So in 1981, Reagan's tax cuts poured billions of dollars into the hands of the rich. And billions flowed into corporations and therefore the stock market. Only these funds never trickled down into the real economy. From this point forward, only the stock market would roar and it would never look back. But the situation on the ground for real working people in the United States never improved. So the wealthy in the country were pretty psyched and the market started going crazy. But Reagan had effectively bankrupt the government. So beginning in 1982, he started raising taxes. In fact, he raised them 11 times throughout his terms. Hang on, let me say that again. <clears throat> In fact, he raised taxes 11 times. When you blow up the national debt with uncontrollable spending and increase taxes, that's called tax and spend. But because Republicans are so much better at messaging than Democrats, the labels have been effectively reversed. The real con job, though, is that the top marginal tax rate dropped from 70% in Reagan's first year to 28% when he left, which means the tax hikes were laid exclusively on the middle class. Incredible, right? Child's play. Reagan and his merry band of assholes were just getting warmed up and planning the biggest score yet, one of the greatest cons ever pulled off by the oligarchy. Reagan pulled off the single biggest tax increase of all time, and no one even realized it. Reagan had a problem. He campaigned on cutting taxes and did just that upon entering office. And the result was catastrophic. The budget deficit exploded and the economy tanked further than the mess he inherited. It was just unsustainable. So Reagan needed a plan and he needed it fast because his tax cuts were so deep that even Social Security was in danger. So the issue they faced was how to raise revenue without making it look like a tax hike and prop up Social Security without losing face. The con was on by Donkey Kong. Now, in order to pull off a con of this size, you can't just do it by yourself. You need a really good team, a team of confidence men. So here's the anatomy of a proper confidence team. First, you need the roper. This is the person that pulls you into the con. Then there's the grifter, the real confidence man on the job. The shill is seemingly unrelated to the caper, but does some quiet heavy lifting. The fixer plays an important organizing role, but should be in the background, a forgettable figure. You'll need an inside man as well. This is your crew member in charge, kind of an operations person. Lastly, the face. This is the pretty face that sells the plan to the unsuspecting Mark. Enter the Roper. The Heritage Foundation, led by Edwin Fulner, issued reports on the instability of Social Security and the need to revisit how it's funded. More than 60% of what the Heritage Foundation published made it into Reagan-era policy, so they knew how to spin a tale. Now, the grifter was Alan Greenspan, 
a Washington gadfly who had just the plan that Reagan needed. The shill behind the con was a veteran legislator named Bob Dole. Bob had a reputation as a dealmaker, and as the head of the Senate Finance Committee, he was in a prime position to make moves behind the scenes. The forgettable figure lurking in the background, our fixer, was none other than Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush. The inside man, largely lost to history now, was a looming figure in Reagan's first term and the biggest promoter of what would become known as Reaganomics, a man named Donald Reagan. Then, of course, there was the face, the man who could sell anything with a wink and a smile, folksy old Ronald Reagan himself. Surely he would never lie to his adoring public. Now here's how they pulled it off. The Reagan tax cuts had effectively emptied the coffers of the U.S. Treasury, and Social Security was already in a pretty fragile state. So the team needed to both shore up the program for the rest of Americans in a way that also protected the wealthiest Americans that were really the target of their tax cuts. So Alan Greenspan drew up an ingenious plan to steadily increase the Social Security deduction from 9% to 15% by 1990. So this was effectively the largest tax increase in U.S. history, but they never called it that. Instead, they sold it as a way to sustain Social Security for years to come because we're all in this together. All of us, that is, except for the wealthy. You see, Republicans couldn't risk losing their wealthy donors, so Greenspan held in place a deduction cap on everyone's income. So once someone hit that cap, they were allowed to simply stop paying into Social Security. So the shill, the fixer, the inside man, and the grifter went into high gear to sell this plan to policymakers, leaving the face to sell it to the mark. Oh, and in case you haven't guessed it by now, you, my dear, are the mark. It was all so brilliant. Because inequality has massively widened beginning with and because of Reagan's policies, real wages for 90% of Americans haven't grown since the 1970s. Meaning the amount of money that we all take home relative to inflation hasn't budged in over 40 years. But the percent that you contribute to Social Security increased by 70%. And as we well know by now, the top 10% of Americans recognized all of the wealth and income gains from Reagan's first term forward. But a billionaire in this country pays the same dollar amount into Social Security as somebody making $170,000. Put another way, if you make 50 grand, you'll have Social Security deducted from your check all year long. If you make a million dollars, you'll be done paying into it by mid-February. In Reagan's day, Social Security deductions impacted about 90% of total income in the United States. Today, it's less than 80%. As the wealth gap widens, this downward trend is going to continue. So now, back to the beatification of Ronald Reagan by Republicans today. True blue Republicans who like to evoke images of the Gipper could use a refresher course. And remember that when Reagan cut taxes in the beginning of his administration, the jobless rate jumped to 9.7%, and the federal deficit grew at a then unprecedented level, prompting his administration to raise taxes on the middle class 11 times before leaving office. He and his crew also left the working class holding the bag on Social Security, something that remains unresolved to this day. There was nothing fiscally conservative about the Reagan era, but the GOP propaganda will always try to convince you that somehow this is the era that we need to return to. So this is the part that I remind you that this financial fuckery was all on top of Reagan blowing up the deficit and doubling the national debt, demonizing so-called welfare queens, boosting the private prison system, ushering in the era of mass incarceration, selling arms secretly to Iran, directing military aid to extremist guerrilla groups in Indonesia, Central America, Africa, and the Middle East to overthrow democratically elected governments, and running an administration that saw investigations, indictments, or convictions of more than 130 officials. Someday, the Trump era will come to a close. <laughs> And the Republicans will look to revive some of these old ghosts and tap into Reagan-style nostalgia. So don't necessarily be on the lookout for the next version of Donald Trump. Be on the lookout for someone far more insidious. They'll be smart, glib, good-looking, and remind you a whole lot of the version of Reagan that they shove down your throats. And remember, you'll never be in on the con. 
you'll always, always be the mark. Here endeth the lesson.